When Tom asked me to speak uh, at this uh, conference, I was uh, quite hesitant because my background is market making. And when I do speak to groups, they're primarily professional trading firms and market making firms. And I sort of asked myself, what can I say to a group that is probably not professional traders, and I doubt if there are any market makers here, that will be of interest. But I have to speak from what I know, and that is my market making background. But I hope what I have to say will give you some insight into what drives option pricing in the marketplace. Even if you can't apply it directly to what you're doing, still I hope, uh, I hope it'll give you a better understanding of the dynamics of option trading. So uh, with that as my uh, disclaimer, um, every market making decision is uh, prefaced by three basic questions. I just want to see here so I can see what I'm talking about. And the three basic questions are, what does the marketplace think a contract is worth? What do I, as the market maker, think a contract is worth? And what other positions am I already carrying? And how a market maker answers these questions will determine basically the prices at which he's willing to buy and sell options. The first question is, what does the marketplace think a contract is worth? Well, uh, this is uh, basically a matter of supply and demand. When we started on the floor, many of us, it was just a matter of looking and listening and seeing what was happening and trying to find an equilibrium price between buyers and sellers. And what you wanted to do is you wanted to be the middleman. You wanted to take a little bit off the bid side and a little bit off the uh, ask side. And in the early days of trading, not just options, this was called scalping, in a sense. The most basic uh, approach to market making, and it doesn't, doesn't involve any mathematical formulas. All right. What do I, as a market maker, think a contract is worth? Well, typically, a market maker will look at two things. He'll look at arbitrage relationships and theoretical evaluation. And Paul Momot uh, talked a little bit about arbitrage this morning. I came into this business with no background in finance at all. And when I heard the word arbitrage, I thought they were mispronouncing Armitage Avenue <laughs> because that was the closest I had ever heard to that. All right, so uh, arbitrage. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say interest and dividends are zero. So we'll take uh, a uh, uh, very simple situation. And here's a stock trading at 93 and a half, and here's a September 90 call trading at 675. Suppose I, as a market maker, am asked for a market in the September 90 put. Well, I don't know anything about the September 90 put, except that I know the stock is trading at a certain price and the call is trading at a certain price. But there is a very basic relationship that shows up almost at the beginning of all option university textbooks, and it's called put call parity. And it says that the call price minus the put price, in the absence of any other considerations, like interest or dividends, should equal the stock price minus the exercise price. If not, there is an arbitrage profit to be had. And in this case, I can see the difference between the stock and the exercise price is 350. Therefore, I know the put should be trading at 325. That's what it should be worth. So what, do, what does the market maker do? He offers a bid price and an ask price. He wants to bid below value and offer above value. So let's say I make a market of 310, 340. Suppose I end up buying the put for my bid price of 310. What I would like to do is I'd like to sell it to somebody else for 325. But option markets usually aren't that liquid. So what I might do is look for an alternative, and it turns out I can sell the put for 325 by synthetically selling it, which means buying the stock and selling the call. And this is a, the most basic type of option arbitrage in the old days, they called it a conversion. And if I did it, I would actually lock in my 15 cent profit the difference between the buying and the selling price. What about theoretical evaluation? Well, theoretical evaluation is based almost all solely on the laws of probability. You take a probability distribution, and you figure out the value of the option, and you make your market around uh, 
that value. You make your bid ask spread. So here's a, a simple example of probability theory. Let's say I'm playing a dice game. And I roll the die, and whatever number I roll, I'll get an equal dollar amount. Now, assuming it's a nice, honest die, we could ask, what is the value of this bet? Well, it's fairly simple arithmetic. You just add up all the outcomes, one through six, and you divide by the probability, one sixth, and you come out with a value of three and a half dollars. Now, suppose I'm a market maker in dice rolls. I've got to offer a bid price and an ask price. What might be my bid ask spread? Well, I'll put up some uh, possibilities here. They're not the only possibilities, but there are three possibilities. I won't read them off. You can see them up on the screen. Which of these might I use to make my market? Well, what I have to ask myself is, what are my goals as a market maker? What am I trying to do? Well, one thing I'm trying to do is attract customers. I'm trying to attract people like you. And presumably, you're knowledgeable. You're not fools. And if I make my market too wide, I'm not going to attract any customers. If I'm selling Volkswagens for $100,000 each, I'm not going to sell very many Volkswagens. On the other hand, uh, as I start to narrow my market, I have to also compete with other market makers. Because in most markets, there is not just one market maker. In most liquid markets, there are multiple market makers. And if I quote a bid-ask spread that's too wide, the other market makers are undercut me. But then I have one other consideration, and that is I need to show a profit. I need to have enough, enough potential profit to offset the risk that I'm taking. So 3.4 might be way too wide to get any customers. 3.49, 3.51 might be way too narrow, because even though I have potential profit, it's not enough to justify the risk I'm taking on. So these are things that market makers are always uh, thinking about. All right, let's go into an option example. So here's a stock trading at 93 and a half, and here comes a broker and asks the market maker, what's the market in the September 95 call? Well, assuming I have no other information, arbitrage information or anything like that, I probably have to use a theoretical pricing model. And then I have to figure out which model is appropriate, Black-Scholes, most common, binomial, very common. There are also other more exotic pricing models. But what I used, in this case, I used a simple Black-Scholes model. And I assumed three months to expiration, a volatility of 26%, and 3% interest rate. So I came out with a theoretical value of 450. All right. So what's my market? Well, I decided to take 15 cents off of each side, 435, 465. Now, in addition to offering a price, a market maker will also offer a size, how many contracts he's willing to do at his bid and offer. So I might say, I'm 500 up. I'm willing to buy up to 500 contracts at my bid price, sell up to 500 contracts at my offer price. If you want to do more than that, I'm recalculating all my bids and offers. Suppose the broker says, I'll sell you 100. That means the broker has given in to my bid price. He doesn't even want to negotiate. So what I've done is I bought 100 of these calls at 435. What's my potential profit? As a trader would say, what's my edge? What's my theoretical profit? Well, I have a, an edge of 15 cents per contract 100 times. And on most stock exchanges in the United States, every point is $100 because it covers 100 shares. So my dollar theoretical edge is $1,500. What am I going to do now? Well, I'm not going to run to the nearest church and pray for something good to happen. <laughs> what? You're going to go to a synagogue. Go to a synagogue. All right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> good point. <laughs> All right. Well, Here's where we have to kind of review a little option theory. And uh, uh, Clemens talked about this this morning, talked about delta hedging, because this is what a trader is going to do. I'm going to calculate the delta of the option, and then I'm going to take an exact opposite delta position in the underlying stock. And 
the delta here, I'll tell you, is 50. I tend to drop the decimal point, as do many older traders. So I'm long 5,000 deltas. I'm going to sell 5,000 shares of stock. I'm delta neutral. And as market conditions change, I'm going to periodically recalculate the delta and buy or sell stock in order to remain delta neutral throughout the life of the option. And what's the result of this? Well, the result in theory, and I emphasize in theory because it doesn't always work this way in the real world, in theory, I ought to show a profit on average of about $1,500. Now, even experienced traders are a little bit mystified about where is this $1,500 coming from exactly. So I try to do a little uh, graphic representation of what's going on. Suppose you buy a call option. What's the value of the option at expiration? Well, everybody will recognize, I presume, the old hockey stick diagram. Zero if the option's out of the money, intrinsic value if it's in the money. But what's the value of an option prior to expiration? Well, prior to expiration, it's a curved line, and it's going to collapse into the hockey stick diagram as time passes. So this is what the theory of option pricing says. I need to calculate the delta, the slope, the first derivative, whatever you want to call it, of the option and then take an exact opposing position in the underlying contract. And what I am here is I'm delta neutral, which means within a small range, I don't care whether the market goes up or down, because what I make on one side, I'll lose on the other. But that's only within a small range. If the moves start to become bigger and bigger, the delta line actually diverges from the option line. For example, let's say the market moves down to here. Well, notice that I have an unhedged amount because my option didn't lose value as fast as my short stock position gained value. And this represents a profit to me. And I'd like to capture that profit. How can I do it? It's very simple. I can recalculate the delta under the new conditions and adjust my hedge to go back to delta neutral. And what I propose to do is I propose to go through this process throughout the life of the option. Every time market conditions change, recalculate the delta and go back to delta neutral. And this is called dynamic hedging. Now, I've oversimplified this because the graph of the option is actually going to change as time passes. I kept it constant here just to make it a little simpler. Now, here is the great insight into the Black-Scholes model. Suppose we add up all those little profit opportunities, all those little brackets that I put up where I have a mismatch. What do you think they should add up to? Well, what Black and Scholes showed uh, with a differential equation is that they add up to the option's theoretical value. So what I did here is I bought the option at 435, and then in theory, again emphasizing in theory, I got 450 back through the dynamic hedging process. And this is what most professional option trading and market making firms are doing. They're just trying to capture the difference between the price and value. Now, sometimes they can do it very quickly because they can turn around and sell the option to somebody else. But in most cases, they have to rely on option pricing theory and go through this dynamic hedging process. Okay? Now, what can go wrong? Unfortunately, a lot can go wrong. It sounds really simple. Um, you might ask, what are the risks of the position? Well, one risk is that you have the wrong inputs into the model or that market conditions might change in ways that are totally unexpected. So the first thing every professional trader does when he's trying to analyze risk is he looks at the Greeks. The numbers that tell us how an options price will be affected by changes in market conditions. And presumably most of you know delta or have heard of delta, gamma, theta, vega, rho. Uh, they're just measures of different types of risks. Now, the biggest risk to most professional traders is what? It's volatility, because it's the one input you're guessing at. You can't directly observe it in the marketplace. And when a lot of money is made or lost in the option markets, uh, it's usually a result of volatility going one way or another. So traders are very sensitive to these volatility uh, 
uh, risks, and they're usually referred to as gamma and vega. So what I did here is I uh, just added up all the risks of my current position where I bought these calls and sold stock. Now, uh, we have two types of volatility risk. We have realized volatility risk and implied volatility risk. Realized is just how much is the underlying stock bouncing around. The implied volatility risk is what does the marketplace think is going to happen? How are they going to change their opinion about volatility as market conditions change? So traders are always trying to control their gamma and vega risk. All right, here comes a new order. And it's for the September 90 put. And my model tells me this put is worth 295. All right, it's a lower priced option. So I'm thinking about making a market. And I say 285, 305. But then before I get the words out of my mouth, I ask myself this question. Will the fact that I already have a position affect my market? Well, what is a trader trying to do? A trader's trying to maintain the profit potential, but reduce the risk. So what I'd really like to do is I'd reduce, like to reduce that gamma and vega risk. And there's only one way you can reduce your gamma and vega risk, and that is by selling options. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to lean in the direction of selling options. How can I lean in that direction? Well, I can change my market. I can lower my bid price and lower my offer price. Now, I'm still around 295, except you can see I'm leaning in the direction of selling because I've lowered my offer price. And I can change my size. I don't have to do 500 up. I can hear, hear say, well, I'd only be willing to buy 300 because I'm going to increase my risk and maybe I don't really want to do that. One thing that uh, customers uh, get upset about is this. They go to a market maker electronically or you know, through a broker and they ask for a market in an option and the market maker quotes a market. And the customer says, well, I'll think about it, and comes back 15 minutes later, and nothing has changed in the market. Volatility hasn't changed, price hasn't changed. Uh, and the customer again asks for a market, and the market maker quotes a different market. Now the customer is starting to think, is he trying to take advantage of me in some way? Uh, probably not. What the customer has to realize is that the, in the intervening period, the market maker may have made some trades, and he has risk that he now has to think about. Because in my example, if I had no risk, I might quote 285, 305. But if I have risk, then I might quote 283, even though market conditions haven't changed at all. So uh, customers also have to understand what the market maker is trying to do. He's not trying to take advantage of the customer. Obviously, he wants the customer's business. But he's trying to stay in business by managing his risk. Now, what else can go wrong? Well, another thing that can go wrong is the model itself. Maybe Black and Scholes or Cox and Ross and Rubenstein, the binomial model, maybe they made some terrible error. Now, they really didn't make any mathematical errors, but they had to base the model on certain assumptions about the dynamics of the marketplace, how the real world works. And if those assumptions aren't realistic, then there's something wrong with the, the values that are coming out of the model. So there are a lot of assumptions built into the model. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but I just wanted to focus on two. Um, one assumption is volatility is independent of the direction in which the underlying price is moving. That is, if the market goes up or down, the same volatility still applies. And another important assumption has to do with the distribution of price returns. The model assumes that the price returns are normally distributed. They look like our old friend, the log normal, the normal distribution. But they're continuously compounded, which for those of you who are familiar with it, leads to a log normal distribution. But we'll just say a normal distribution. Now, are these assumptions realistic? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say the stock index, this was the S&P when I made up the example, is at 2,900. And I tell you, four weeks later, it can go to 2,700 or 3,100. Do you think the index will be more volatile at 2,700 or 3,100? Well, anybody that's been around stock markets for any period of time realizes that most stock markets get more volatile as they go down and less volatile as they go up. 
Not always true, but in many, many, many cases that's true. Well, this leads to a big, big problem for professional traders. And here's the problem. Let's say I buy an at-the-money straddle. I hope most of you know what a straddle is. So I buy the 2900 straddle. My question is, what's the delta position of this straddle? Well, most traders would look at this, myself included, and say, it's probably close to delta neutral. Now, I know theoretically it's very slightly positive because of this log normal distribution. But for practical purposes, it looks delta neutral. But what does delta neutral mean? Delta neutral means you don't care which way the market's going. But if I had this position, which way would I like the market to go? <laughs> I heard a few ups. <laughs> well, let me rephrase the question. Would I like the market to become more volatile or less volatile? More volatile. And what did we say about stock-related markets? They tend to become more volatile on the way down. So in fact, in the Black-Scholes world, this is more or less delta neutral. In the real world, an experienced trader would say, that's a delta negative position. How negative? I don't know. That's what financial engineers do. I worked for a firm for 15 years. And we had an uh, army of financial engineers. And their problem is to figure out, how do we assign a delta to this position? Now, if you're trading very small, it probably doesn't make that much difference. But suppose you've got thousands and thousands of options across different exercise prices and different expiration dates. You better manage your risk, or you're going to be put out of business. All right, so that's one problem. And I did put in, in if you're trading a physical commodity, you might have the opposite opinion, because many physical commodities tend to become more volatile on the way up. All right, what about how the price changes are distributed? Um, Michael, uh, before lunch, he put up a histogram, a very simple histogram. And I actually did a little uh, more uh, complete histogram of the S&P 500 going back to 2010. I got a database of the daily price changes. And these are the price changes uh, rounded to the nearest quarter percent uh, daily price changes. So that's the real world. But what does the model see? Well, I drew the normal distribution that best fits this database. And that's what the uh, spreadsheet drew for me. So the model sees the red line, but the real world are the blue bars. So how do they differ? Well, one obvious place is right in the middle. You get many more days with small moves than is predicted by normal distribution. Now, what's not easy to see, and I'll just go back a little bit here, is these outliers. Out at the tails, there are moves, big moves, that you would not expect to see in the real world. Now, what do I mean by you would not expect to see? Well, I actually calculated the statistics for those who are interested associated with the distribution. And the biggest up move or down move was 7.08 standard deviations. And that happened back in, uh, what is it, August of 2011. What is the probability of that? Well, my spreadsheet could just barely calculate it. It's less than one in a trillion. And the biggest up move was five and a quarter standard deviations. And that shouldn't happen more than once in 14 million occurrences. So in the real world, you're getting these big occurrences much more often than is predicted by any normal distribution. Now, I can tell you this is not just a characteristic of the S&P, although the S&P tends to be kind of extreme. But every traded market that's been studied tends to have similar characteristics. More days with small moves and more days with big moves. And portfolio managers sometimes call them tail risk or event risk or whatever they're calling it. And they have to worry about this. Now, a good question is, what does the marketplace think of all this? Because the marketplace is fairly intelligent. And you can do a little exercise. It takes a bit of arithmetic. But you can actually back out the distribution from the option prices that the marketplace thinks applies. So I did this back uh, in March. And there's the log normal distribution that the model thinks is appropriate from the volatility. But taking the prices, this is the implied distribution. How does the implied distribution differ from the, uh, from the log normal distribution? Well, you can see 
there happens to be, or there seems to be, a bigger chance of a small upward move. There also is a smaller chance of a big upward move a smaller chance of a small downward move and a bigger chance of a big downward move. And you know what? The marketplace has probably got it pretty close to what the real world uh, says is likely to happen. All right, what else? Uh, traders have uh, long noted that implied volatility is vary across exercise price and across expiration date sometimes called the term structure volatility and volatility skew. So market making firms that need to manage risk, they need to take this into consideration. And what they usually do is they try to create a volatility surface, figuring out what's likely to happen to implied volatilities if the market goes up or down or time passes or other market conditions change. Now, uh, this can be pretty complicated, but uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, some volatility skews. This is how uh, implied volatilities vary across exercise price. And I went back on March 29th, and these were some volatility skews in the S&P 500. So you can look at the legend there and see what these numbers represent. Now, what a financial engineer will try and do is he'll try and ask, how are these related? Can I somehow normalize these so that I can make it part of my volatility surface. And a very common way of normalizing it is just to change the axes, to change the x-axis to, weeks to, oh, I got that wrong. Uh, the x-axis should be sta uh, standard deviations. So if you look at this, uh, I didn't catch that error. Should be standard deviations, and the y-axis should be, is implied volatility compared to the at the money or at the forward they sometimes say uh, implied volatility. And if you change the axes, these things have uh, fairly similar characteristics. Now, modeling the term structure is a little more difficult. But uh, here are some term structures, that is the uh, variation in implied volatility across expiration dates uh, during March and April. And this was a period of relatively low implied volatility. Now, what you can see here is that the near-term contracts tend to have lower implied volatility than the long-term contracts. So it's upward sloping, or uh, they sometimes say a contango market. But I went back to December of 2018, and that was a period of relatively high volatility. And here, the contracts slope downward, a backward market sometimes. And what financial engineers try to do is they try to figure out if implied volatility changes, what's going to happen to the implied volatilities across the different exer uh, expiration dates? And there are different ways of handling it. I've seen a few ways. I'm not a highly trained mathematician, but I kind of know what they're trying to do. OK, so I don't want to overstay my welcome here. Uh, but summing up, a market maker is essentially trying to do the same thing over and over. What's the market maker trying to do? Get an edge, manage the risk. Get an edge, manage the risk. Get an edge, manage the risk. Now, new market makers sometimes think, what's the secret to success? The secret is getting an edge, getting a big potential profit. But you only have an edge if you know what the right theoretical value is, and who knows what the right theoretical value is. So I would say most experienced market makers will tell you the secret to success is managing risk understanding how option prices will change as market conditions change, and asking how you're going to protect yourself if things go wrong, but also how you're going to maximize your, uh, your profit when things go right. Because sometimes we're lucky, sometimes we're unlucky, and we want to be prepared for both eventualities. Now, managing risk requires what? Well, it requires theoretical knowledge. How does a model work? What are the risks of using the model? We talked about the risks, uh, some of the risks here. Practical knowledge. What are the unique characteristics of, of a market? A stock market is different than an interest rate market, and that's different than a foreign exchange market or a commodity market. And it doesn't, no matter how well you understand theory, you still have to apply that theory in a particular setting, a particular market. Also, market makers need to understand what other people are doing and why they're doing it. Not that they're going to take advantage of customers, but it's uh, important to understand the dynamics of the marketplace. And finally, 
what do you need? You need common sense. If something is going on and you can't explain it, then maybe you ought to take a step back and think about what is causing what you're seeing in the market.